so on your way here, you probably used your cell phone app to check into your flight. As you were sitting on the plane, you likely opened up an app to stream movies. And then once you landed, you probably hopped in an Uber or Lyft to get over here to the Silverado. And actually, when I got here yesterday, I realized I forgot sunscreen, which is not good for me. And so I had Instacart here in 20 minutes and voila, sunscreen. And so across every part of our lives, our expectations for service, and this has been uh, alluded to many times this morning, have really risen higher and higher and higher. And we're bringing those expectations into the healthcare arena. At the same time, the care delivery landscape is also changing, and, and Richard gave a great overview of this this morning as well. Digital is allowing large healthcare systems to deliver care across broader geographic boundaries. Venture capitalists like Andy are pouring tons of money into digital health companies. Payers, as we've talked about, are getting increasingly into care delivery. And of course, I'm sure we'll talk about this all through the day, big tech now getting involved in a bigger way uh, with Amazon's purchase of One Medical Group. So since high tech passed about 15 years ago, We've been trying to leverage technology to really impact care delivery in a big way. And yes, we can e-prescribe now, we can view lab results across different systems, we can read each other's notes, although I will admit I still have no idea what ophthalmology is trying to tell me and I may never uh, overcome that barrier. I think the question is, has technology really impacted these biggest problems that we face in care delivery in a big way, disparities, access, cost. And so you might be wondering, okay, over the next decade, how is technology going to help me with all of these challenges and all of these barriers that we face? Well, one thing we can always do is look to other industries for analogs. So you might say, well, let's look to one of the earliest large online retailers to sell us things through the internet, or one of the largest early companies to stream media to our personal devices. And of course, we all know exactly who these companies are, right? So you probably were thinking of Amazon and Netflix. And what differentiated Amazon and Netflix from Sears and Blockbuster? Was it their technology? Maybe a little bit. But Sears and Blockbuster, at the end of the day, were delivering a similar product to what Amazon and Netflix put together. But what Amazon and Netflix figured out, and, and Bob and Andy were talking about this, it's culture. They knew how to take data and to use their technology to collect and capture data about your end-to-end -end experience as a customer. They built people and process and a culture of continuous learning around those data sets, and they used it to iteratively improve the products and services that they delivered. Now, bear in mind, when we have deployed electronic health records across the US over the last 10 plus years, we probably have looked a lot more like Sears and Blockbuster. We took our existing product, we papered over it with technology, and we haven't really fundamentally transformed the way we deliver care. And so one message that I want to leave you with today is that technology alone is not going to solve our challenges and that what we have to do over the next decade is going to be much harder than what we did with electronic health records. So I grew up in Los Angeles, a couple blocks from Arts Deli, went there for uh, brunch every Sunday morning with my grandparents. And they have a huge menu, many people here from New York, so people know large deli menus, try to have something on the menu for everyone who's there. Now contrast that to what it looks like when Arts puts their menu on DoorDash. DoorDash understands with great precision all of the most popular menu items across the country for thousands and thousands of restaurants. They can tell us pastrami or corned beef, the age old question, the answer, corned beef. <laughs> and so they are delivering precise food options to the consumer across the country. They know they can personalize to our individual needs for what you like and what we want as consumers. And so our transformation over the next decade is to not just be healthcare companies, we have to become data companies. So if you're thinking, I don't wanna be Sears or Blockbuster, I'm with you there. If you're not thinking that, there's a golf course uh, over there that you, can, that you can go to. So hopefully you are thinking you don't wanna be like Sears. And I hope to give you over the next about 10 minutes some practical tips 
uh, of how you can start thinking about transforming your organization and transforming your culture to one that's more data driven. So first, where not to start. So the temptation as we start thinking about AI and what's, how's AI gonna transform healthcare is let's create the AI doctor and let's use AI for all of these very complex, fancy, high-end use cases. And my advice is don't start there. There are so many more low-hanging fruit opportunities and places where you can implement AI into your organizations. So at UCSF, like many of you, yes, the fax has not gone away, and so we still get one and a half million fax documents per year. About a quarter million of them are referrals that get faxed in, and we were paying an army of people to enter all of that information in off the fax machine. So we're deploying AI now to actually ingest information much more uh, accurately, quickly, cheaply, so that we can have those staff move to higher, uh, higher end opportunities to interact with our patients and deliver actual care rather than just being data entry clerks. And there are opportunities like this all throughout our organizations. Prior authorization paperwork, staffing predictions, supply chain, revenue cycle. There are so many opportunities to, and I know Chris is gonna uh, talk later about uh, improving the joy of practice. Let's get the administrative burden and use AI to get mundane tasks that people don't want to do off of their plates. So I want to see us leverage technology and find the opportunities to use it to restore the doctor-patient relationship. One opportunity, and it's very early days, and I think uh, you know, this is not a technology yet ready for prime time, but I'm optimistic over time that it will get there, is ambient listening in the exam room to capture and reduce the burden of clinical documentation. Uh, another large academic medical center who deployed one of these technologies recently found that 94% of the physicians who used it felt like they would be completely disappointed if it were taken away from them and they wouldn't want to work anywhere that didn't have it. And if you think about the next generation of physicians and they're going to vote with their feet when they're choosing a medical practice to work for. They're going to want an environment that provides them decision support, reduces the burden of documentation, and so it's incumbent upon us to provide them with that tool set that makes it easier to practice and helps restore the doctor-patient relationship. And it really is the most precious resource uh, in healthcare. So I think Eric Topol got it right when he said, let's not worry about using AI to cure cancer. Let's use AI to instead eliminate these burdensome administrative tasks that are dragging us down, that are making our day-to-day -day, uh, lives less enjoyable, that are taking away from our ability to connect with our patients and, and really meet them uh, and have a human connection. And while the uh, doctor-patient relationship is a very precious resource, it's also very expensive, and we know the current system is unsustainable. We can't rely on a synchronous interaction in a physical location to be the only place that healthcare happens. It's not gonna scale, and we know that's unsustainable. And telemedicine, by eliminating geography uh, as one of the barriers, is helping a little bit, but fundamentally, it's still a synchronous unit of time and interaction between the doctor and patient. We have to be thinking about how to use technology and use digital to introduce newer models of care that allow people to practice to the top of their license, that use different types of professionals and staff to deliver care, that think about layering in asynchronous technologies uh, to deliver care and not just the default being uh, synchronous care. So there are some examples of success. One story from UCSF, we have about 500 patients who have had a lung transplant and are now living post-transplant with us. They live all over the Western United States. And so we used to actually fly pulmonologists to Boise, to Portland, to Reno uh, on a monthly basis to try to meet with patients uh, at satellite locations. And instead, what we're now doing is we sent people a home spirometer. They engage with a uh, patient-reported outcomes uh, collection chatbot, essentially. So it's texting patients once a week, checking in to see if they have shortness of breath, if they have cough, what other symptoms they have, screening them for rejection. And the program has been very successful, and we've reduced by about 25% the, uh, 
the frequency with which these patients have to actually come to San Francisco to receive some form of in-person care. But as I talk to colleagues around the country and in our own experience at UCSF, remote monitoring is still, uh, in many cases, technology looking for a problem. The road is really littered with many failed pilots and programs that have been successful at a small scale and really have not uh, succeeded in scaling up. And I think our learning thus far and what has made the lung transplant program particularly successful is when you have a, uh, a program like this, it has to provide a benefit to the patients, a benefit to the care teams, as well as an economic benefit. And so as you're thinking about remote monitoring programs, uh, you, you really have to have all three of these to be successful. So what's the holy grail? Where are we going in 10 years? Where do we all want to be? Of course, we want to ingest genomics data and patient reported symptoms and outcomes and use wearables to understand people's physiologic states and to use machine learning to take all of that data and understand which precise, just like DoorDash, right, which precise uh, cohort of patients and, and population segment are you in and what's the right treatment course for you. And then once we understand which population you're a part of and we know your treatment path, how do we use modern engagement uh, to help individualize your experience and make sure you're on the right treatment path all throughout your journey? Well, we're still a long way from that. We're moving from a world where maybe things felt a little bit orderly and we knew what course we were on and we knew the destination. And where we have to get to is being able to sense the environment and use data and use analytics to understand what's happening in the market around us what our customers want, and how to react and respond in a much more dynamic, rapid fashion. So how are we going to do that? So again, the example I gave earlier is not falling into the same trap of just turning on a technology and thinking that it's going to solve our problem. So many years ago at, at UCSF, if we were turning on something like, uh, or deploying something like self-scheduling to our patients, we might have turned it on and sent the team off to another project uh, and moved on. And instead, what we're trying to do is learn the lessons from Amazon and from Netflix and companies like that who de dedicate a team to understanding that part of the patient journey, and they don't move on to the next project. They're trying to fix in perpetuity the new patient experience of seeking care with us. And they're using data to illuminate that end-to-end -end patient journey. So what words did they search to find care? Did they use a computer or a mobile phone to find us? When they got to our website, were there appointments available or did they look at empty shelves and move on? And then when we ask them for their information, like their insurance card or demographic data, did they abandon or did they actually go through and schedule? And then of course our net promoter score uh, at the end of that experience to see how we're doing. And actually understanding at a very granular level at each point in that journey, where did they experience friction? And not moving on to the next project from self-scheduling, but again, having a dedicated team who wakes up every morning looking at that data and looking for the next opportunity to wring just that next bit of friction out of that process. Now, what happens is you start looking at customer experience data in that way, and as you have dedicated teams, is you realize that care doesn't happen just inside of your four walls. So if we thought that by putting up a patient portal app or turning on a self-scheduling app that we were comprehensively addressing the patient journey for, for accessing healthcare, we're wrong. People's healthcare journey starts on Google. So seven, something like 70% of people's front door to healthcare is a Google search. And so one of, the, one of the fallacies we have to give up is this idea that we control the patient's entire experience within our practices or in our groups, but that we're part of this more integrated experience that they have where they're gonna come in and out of our walls to get healthcare. And what that naturally connects to as well is that we're no longer factories. We are not controlling all of the work that happens and we don't have to be the ones who deliver and own every part of the healthcare journey that our patients have. And so starting to think about what are our core competencies or what are your core competencies as an organization and where can you actually partner? If the patient needs diagnostic tests, do they have to come to my lab where they're going to pay me 
to draw blood? Or can I send a home phlebotomist from a third party partner to help make that easier for the patient and get that same diagnostic test result? And so really examining deeply what our core competencies are and where we need to excel and where we need to partner. I had another experience a couple of weeks ago uh, that really made me reflect, and, and maybe some of you have had something similar. I called in a food order, I went to the restaurant to pick it up, and I waited in line for like half an hour, uh, even though my food, I think, had been ready and was sitting in the back. Because there was, there was one cashier sitting there taking everyone who had made their phone orders, all of the in-restaurant diners, the Uber Eats drivers, the DoorDash drivers, we were all converging on this one person sitting there. And what I realized is that the world was designed for thinking about the analog world and the digital world separately. And we really have to redesign experiences to acknowledge and, and make the most of the fact that digital and in-person are gonna be woven together. And maybe we need to redesign processes and workflows and the way our facilities are structured to account for that. As we start moving from very siloed data sets looking in the past retrospectively to see what happened, thinking about technology as a cost center to a world, hopefully several years from now, where you're viewing technology as a strategic enabler of your business, where you have a, a holistic, comprehensive set of data that allows you to understand your patient's experience and where you're getting real-time intelligence. EHR is going to be foundational to uh, this change over the coming decade, but you're gonna need a lot more than that, and you're gonna need to thoughtfully integrate together and orchestrate uh, among all of these different systems that are your command center and decision support tools and communications platforms and remote monitoring and technology that's connecting uh, to patient devices at home. And so your, your technology teams are gonna be working through developing uh, integrated uh, uh, platforms and systems that look more like this. So I want to leave you with, with uh, one thing before uh, Bob comes back up here and grills me. And, and it's a reminder to not fall into the trap that Sears and Blockbuster did. So don't look at uh, the website that you put up or the patient portal app that you uh, deployed to people's phones and, and pat ourselves on the back and say, now I've, I've done it, I've got the customer experience that I want. What we have to do over the next decade is so much harder than that. Uh, as leaders, we really have to transform who we are as organizations, the culture in our organizations to become digital organizations that understand how to use data. So of course, it starts with operational ex excellence and having standardization of practice uh, across your organizations. You have to think about new types of talent to hire and bring in designers, service designers, data scientists, product managers. These are roles, did people in digital marketing, these are the types of roles that healthcare organizations don't commonly even have job descriptions for, but those are the kinds of people who we need to start bringing to our organizations for this to happen. You're gonna need all of these types of new technologies and platforms uh, that I showed you on the previous slide, and of course, get extremely good at collecting data, learning how to use data, and probably much more important than that isn't just capturing it, but building the teams and the structures and the culture of data literacy and understanding how to ask the right questions of data and really transforming our cultures. Rethinking our business models, again, moving from sort of factory thinking and being pipeline businesses to really thinking about ourselves as platforms that are focused on delivering outcomes and not necessarily controlling everything uh, as part of the patient's experience. And to do that, really de uh, developing capabilities around partnerships and, and integrating together different systems uh, to deliver the outcomes to patients. Thank you so much.